and uh, our last speaker, but not least, um, Carl Svoboda from uh, Genelia Farm um, on flow of information underlying tactile decisions. Great. It's really an honor to be here. Tell you uh, about some recent work from the laboratory um, that um, uh, has a strong connection to uh, to uh, MIT, um, and in particular, it's uh, work. If I can get this up here, uh, it's it's work that has been uh, mainly. Uh, performed by Nuo Lee, uh, and Nuo was a graduate student at uh, MIT in uh, Jim DeCarlo's lab, and also an undergraduate uh, with uh, Dora. Uh, so thanks, guys, for training him. Um, so um, the, today I'd like to tell you about uh, motor planning, and um, as many of you know, uh, movements, uh, are, voluntary movements are, tip are often planned, and if there's a, a period of movement that uh, precedes a voluntary action. The subsequent movement is more precise, accurate, and faster than it would otherwise be. Okay, and uh, just to convince you that uh, motor planning is part of important life skills. This is uh, Marcel Andre, who is the current current world record holder in solving the Rubik's cube uh, blind. Okay, so he kind of investigates and. Uh, forms a mental image of the Rubik's Cube for a few seconds, then he's blindfolded. And all the while, he's building up a motor plan. Um, and uh, then when blindfolded, he executes that motor plan into 65 uh, precise rotations, ultimately solving the thing uh, in his world, rec world record run in about uh, 28 seconds, OK? So now, this is uh, sort of motor planning on steroids. <laughs> But um, sort of, so the neurobiology of motor planning is really mainly based on these kinds of experiments, uh, directed reaching, pointing, uh, directional licking uh, in our exam, uh, in our case. So, is this the train, actually? OK, so um, in, in these experiments, uh, you, <laughs> good, my luck. Um, so uh, there, there's an instructional cue. These are instructed movements, OK, where the primate in these classic experiments by Tanji and Everett is either pushing or pulling um, a lever. And uh, the puzzling feature uh, in those days, and this is in the motor cortex, and this is seen across many motor cortical areas, it's more prevalent in premotor supplemental uh, motor areas, is that there's preparatory activity that anticipates the movement often seconds before uh, the movement, OK? And um, so this has been known up for a while, and hundreds of studies have dealt with preparatory activity in various motor cortical areas. But it, it's still, and it's really one of the first cognitive uh, or neurophysiological correlates of a cognitive phenomenon. Uh, but the relationship of uh, these activity patterns to behavior um, are still quite mysterious, right? So the simplest question is, is this preparatory, this anticipatory activity or preparatory activity actually causally related uh, to upcoming movements. That's sort of the question uh, number one that we'd like to um, address. And we've gone some way, I think, towards addressing. OK, the second question, and this is not shown. Um, uh, well, the, the second question is, this is in the motor cortex, right? Why does the animal not move uh, during this preparatory uh, activity? What prevents it from movement while there is preparatory activity that actually anticipates specific movement. I should have said that preparatory activity is distinguished by anticipating specific movements, even during error trials, and does not occur in different uh, movements. And finally, and this is not shown here very nicely in this slide, across neurons, preparatory activity, and I'll show you examples of that from my own work, is incredibly diverse. The time course of preparatory neurons, they come on. Uh, they turn off, other neurons then turn on, turn off, neurons turn on early, others late. Uh, all kinds of things seem to be intermingled. How is the dynamics of preparatory activity actually, play? how does that play itself out in motor cortex uh, circuits? Okay, to begin to address these questions, we've adopted uh, the mouse uh, for the study of these simple uh, cognitive uh, behaviors, and of course mice better right now, and I know this is changing rapidly, give us access to cell type, which are really the nodes 
of the circuit diagram, right? This is really where circuit analysis in many ways starts. Now in the laboratory, we use a simple tactile behavior, okay? This is a, um, a behavior where head fixed mice sit under the microscope and a pole comes within reach and typically for the purpose of this talk in one of two locations, a uh, posterior location and anterior location, the mouse has to move its whiskers to judge object location, make a decision about object location based on touches that happen during this well-defined sample epoch, about a second in duration, okay? But then they have to kind of hold the decision in mind for delay period lasting uh, a second or longer uh, before responding by either licking left for water reward or licking right for water reward, judge, uh, based on a judgment of whether or not the pole was uh, posterior or anterior, okay? And this delay period then allows us to, of course, study using, uh, for, for the purposes of neurophysiology and manipulation, this sampling uh, kind of process and the response process and the motor planning uh, process separately. It essentially gives us more time resolution for these, uh, for neurophysiological experiments and manipulations. This is, of course, a trick that has been used for many, many years in primate neurophysiology. Now, this is how this looks. Um, the pole comes within reach, the animal holds its tongue correctly and then vigorously licks uh, in the uh, correct location. And here too, like in the reaching tasks, with the delay period, the animal actually licks more precisely and with shorter reaction time than without the delay period, okay? All right, now, it's a complex behavior. There's a lot going on, right? The first question that we have to ask really uh, what is the flow of information underlying this simple tactile uh, decision uh, task? Where might motor planning areas uh, be, right? And when I talk about flow of information, I mean not only task-related activity uh, in neurons uh, in the brain, because uh, trust me, you can find task-related activity in this kind of operant condition task anywhere, the olfactory bulb, visual cortex, and so on and so forth. But rather, the uh, brain areas, uh, we want to identify the brain areas that actually co where activity is causally related uh, to specific phases of the task. And I'd like to show you how we do this. This was published recently, so I'll go through this very, very quickly, okay? And this allowed us to um, identify motor planning area, premotor cortex in the mouse that is critically involved and causally related to planning uh, directed uh, movements, okay? And then towards the end, I'd like to show you how within uh, the motor cortex, uh, planning activity is converted into a, a motor command within hierarchically organized structured motor cortex circuits. So to uh, look at the flow of excitation across cortex, we use an inactivation method. And the method that we use is, is, is based on the technology that you've heard about uh, quite a bit. It's optogenetics. Uh, mice, uh, we use transgenic mice, actually another connection to MIT from Gauping Feng that express channel opsin in GABAergic neurons that allow us to turn on activity in about a millimeter volume of cortical tissue with about better than 100 millisecond temporal resolution to essentially to completion, okay? And we've, uh, this is really a wonderful way um, to do this, okay? Both high spatial, reasonably high spatial resolution at the level of brain areas and temporal resolution at the level of these behavioral epochs, okay? Then, now we have a behavior with the photo uh, silencing method the third part of the experiment is a new kind of preparation where we replace the dorsal skin um, of uh, the mouse with a clear skull cap, essentially just polished clear dental cement that makes um, virtually all of the relevant brain areas accessible for chronic photostimulation, or in this case, inhibition over chronic time scales so that we can silence uh, individual brain areas over tens or hundreds of thousands of trials over up to a year uh, to explore many of these brain regions uh, for their involve involvement in uh, the uh, task. Okay, so uh, we uh, access about 55 uh, brain regions through uh, in different task epochs. We stimulate or rather silence one brain region at a time to ask uh, whether or not that brain region is critically involved in the behavior during these different behavioral epochs, okay? So, um, so here is the first result. Uh, so this is now uh, for silencing uh, during, the, um, uh, during the sample epoch. And to our delight, the only region 
okay, that lit up as being significant okay, in affecting the behavior when silence is the barrel cortex. So uh, we've silenced 55 different uh, regions, and what you're seeing essentially is kind of a generalization of an imaging experiment where uh, the uh, photostimulation location or the silencing location, of course, is essentially the pixel position, and the contrast in the pixel is the behavioral uh, change, uh, in this, ca this case, behavioral reduction, and only when silencing the barrel cortex uh, do we see a behavioral impairment. And the pattern of confusion in this experiment is essentially consistent with the animal not feeling the pole, perhaps not uh, surprising. Now, when we record from these experiments, uh, from, these, uh, from the barrel cortex during these experiments, again, uh, consistent uh, with the uh, silencing experiment, we see object location-dependent activity in the barrel cortex, uh, in particular, stronger um, activity for the blue pole location and red pole location, which is expected because the animal interacts more strongly with the blue pole location and the red pole location. And on error trials, uh, the activity still uh, mainly uh, uh, represents the pole location rather than the upcoming choice. So true kind of sensory activity. Now, what about during the delay period? Now, we're stimulating during the delay period, okay, and we see that the barrel cortex has ceased to be important, okay, for execution of the trial. Information seems to have passed on uh, to um, anterior motor cortex. And the, the nomenclature is very confusing um, in rodents. We call this anterior lateral motor cortex. It's also it's part of M2, also the rostral. Uh, forelimb area and so on and so forth. These are all uh, uh, kind of overlapping uh, and defined in various uh, situations. Okay, so, and in this, um, uh, it, 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 when we silence this area during the late period, we find that the pattern of confusion is consistent with the contralesional neglect. Okay, so um, here a bunch of uh, control experiments where the animals look either in the, contra look either in the contralateral direction or the ipsilateral direction depending on the pole location, when we now silence um, ALM, this anterolateral motor cortex, um, in, um, on one side, we cause almost subsequently in the response period, which can be hundreds of milliseconds later, an ipsilateral bias, almost no contralateral response. Of course, there's a ghost response uh, curve that underlies this, but a strong ipsilateral bias, a contralesional neglect. Okay. And now, when we record from uh, the, uh, this ALM, um, anterior lateral motor cortex, we see consistent with motor planning, or this, this uh, pattern of confusion is consistent with motor planning because we uh, silence during the planning component of the task and cause, uh, um, essentially cause a bias in the upcoming movements. We see uh, preparatory activity, the kinds of uh, responses in Everts and many others have uh, observed in uh, motor cortex in, in primates, mainly in premotor areas. So for example, ramping activity that is choice selective. So neuron that ramps up during the uh, uh, sample period and uh, uh, maintains its selectivity up to the go queue, right, when the activity collapses. Another neuron that starts to ramp up during the delay period and becomes even more selective upon uh, the movement queue. And a third type of neuron more sort of kind of an upper motor neuron kind of response, neuron that becomes selective only upon the go queue. And these neurons come in about, uh, each one uh, is, a, uh, is apparent about, uh, corresponds to about one third of the recorded cells. Again, kind of consistent with premotor areas in uh, primates. So now in these neurons, again, consistent with motor planning activity, the activity is choice selective because on um, error trials, the activity again, predicts the movement now does not reflect uh, the sensory stimulus. So true bona fide uh, preparatory activity. Okay, so what I've shown you in the, uh, in the first part of the talk is that the barrel cortex is critical for sensation in this tactile uh, uh, task. And then information is passed on to a premotor cortex that we call ALM, um, okay, that is critically involved for motor planning and also the generation of movement. Now let's, for the next 10 minutes, I'd like to drill in uh, and uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, uh, this um, ALM and how preparatory activities converted to, uh, uh, to movement commands. 
So now, um, as I mentioned, uh, the activity in uh, ALM in even one hemisphere is extremely diverse, not only in temporal uh, dynamics, okay, but also in the selectivity. Uh, what we find is that in, that in one uh, hemisphere, there's about an equal number of neurons, apparently intermingled neurons that predict contra and ipsilateral movements. Okay? So this is a cumulative histogram where we bin uh, selective neurons in 200 milliseconds bin, and you can see there's a roughly balanced proportion of neurons that predict contralateral movements and neurons that are selected for ipsilateral movements intermingled in one hemisphere. And that's extremely puzzling because remember that the effect of the lesion of the silencing is a strong ipsilateral bias, a contra uh, neglect. So here is another mystery, right? We have bilaterally distributed representations of ipsy uh, in red and, and, and contra in blue uh, movements, but a strong contralesional neglect. And this, by the way, is also observed in other species uh, in other contexts. So here, for example, is the uh, famous prepotential, Breitschaft's potential recorded over the frontal lobes of human uh, subjects, this is an EEG recording, uh, uh, anticipating a voluntary uh, movement, a, a directed movement of the right hand. The prepotential, the preparatory potential is bilaterally symmetric, but if the underlying region, regions are lesioned uh, unilaterally, we get this profound uh, spatial neglect. Movements into the ipsilateral hemisphere are uh, preferred and into the contralateral part of the space are uh, um, are neglected, uh, called also spatial neglect. So how then are directional movements generated from this intermingled bilateral and distributed uh, uh, representation? Well, one uh, possibility is that we miss some fine scale structure of this anterior lateral medial, cort uh, anterior lateral medial, uh, anterior lateral motor cortex, okay, the, uh, because of course with uh, electrode methods we have limited spatial resolution. There could be uh, smaller hidden brain areas. The mouse brain is organized on length, uh, length scales down to the mouse cortex is organized on length scales down to about 200 microns, uh, as uh, uh, indicated by some of the visual areas that have been identified by uh, Burkhalter and others. So maybe we, we're missing some kind of uh, long, uh, strongly contralateral biased uh, area within the ALM. Uh, so to look for this kind of area, we did imaging experiments using uh, GCAMP. We now look at layer five neurons. I'll just show you two trials and then the take home message. This is a contra trial. Uh, now uh, for, uh, during behavior, neurons show fluorescence transients that correspond to uh, trains of action potentials. Uh, different neurons light up at different phases of the trial, indicated right here, but a different set of neurons light up on contra trials and on ipsy trials, and these neurons appear to be completely intermingled. So neighboring neurons are equally likely to be part of the same representation, ipsy or contra, or of different representations. Okay, and this is analyzed here. So uh, reassuringly with the imaging, we see the same kinds of responses, modulo low pass filtering as with neurophysiology, and uh, they are completely intermingled. So we think we're not missing some kind of fine scale organization of this motor cortex, okay, that might explain uh, the lesion experiment. Instead, uh, what we think is the answer, at least part of the answer, is that we have to think of this activity in the context of hierarchically organized cell types and, um, um, and uh, circuits, okay? And for the purposes of uh, this talk, I'll just um, uh, tell you about two cell types, namely intratelencephalic neurons and pyramidal tract neurons. These are the major projection classes um, in the cortex, magenta and uh, green, and they're hierarchically organized. And as you probably know, the intratelencephalic neurons um, are also called corticocortical neurons. They receive input from other cortical areas and project to other cortical areas. So they uh, really bind different cortical areas together. They're important for sensory motor integration and also connect different motor cortical areas together. They're connected to each other and they also connect the two hemispheres uh, to each other. And these intratelencephalic neurons, which are the majority of cortical projection neurons, upstream 
of pyramidal tract neurons, which are the output neurons of the cortex. And it's these neurons that project to the brainstem and the spinal cord to actually uh, drive uh, movements, okay? So now the hypothesis then is then perhaps there's a distributed uh, representation at the level of intratelencephalic neurons across both hemispheres. And then perhaps a directional population signal only arises at the level of pyramidal tract neurons. And uh, the effects of lesions are really a manifestation of uh, lesioning the pyramidal tract neurons, OK? And I should tell you, uh, wrong button here, that um, the uh, pyramidal tract neurons in ALM, in this motor cortex, also poise to directly drive or influence directional licking. This is based both on anatomical tracing studies. I'll just give you a summary. The pyramidal tract neurons project to the immediate nucleus of the reticular formation in the brainstem, which then projects to the hypoglossal nucleus, which then affects the intrinsic muscle of the tongue, and also microstimulation experiments where when you stimulate the pyramidal tract neurons on one side, even in anesthetized animals, one can drive directional licking in the contralateral uh, direction, but not in the ipsilateral direction. And this only happens in ALM, not in uh, primary motor areas. So now, of course, the task is to do cell type specific neurophysiology and manipulation. We first uh, do an imaging experiment where we now combine uh, the uh, two photon imaging with retrograde labeling of intratelencephalic neurons with, uh, labeled here with one retrograde marker and pyramidal tract neurons labeled with another, another retrograde marker. Here are the intermingled neurons at the level of layer five. Again, the pyramidal tract neurons are in, a, in the minority. And when we now look at the selectivity of these different types of neurons, we find a strong enrichment of uh, contrast selectivity in the pyramidal tract neurons uh, compared to the intratelencephalic neurons, okay? Now, this um, is uh, nice. Um, it turns out that it has some limitation at the level of temporal um, resolution. So uh, Noor did, um, I think, a really nice experiment uh, by electrophysiologically target, uh, tagging uh, these different neuronal populations based on their projection targets. And I think um, this gives us a lot of additional uh, information. So he labeled layer five neurons with channel interruption and then excited their axons either in the contralateral ALM or in the brainstem to backfire IT neurons or PT neurons. This is actually a challenging experiment. So you have to do the classic collision test to make sure that you actually record from directly channel interruption photostimulated neurons rather than neurons downstream of these photostimulated neurons. He did that, and what he found is that only in the pyramidal tract neurons is there contralateral population bias that arises during the delay period anticipating the neuron, uh, the movement, but only relatively late uh, during the delay period. Okay, you can see this here in the uh, green line. This bias is not observed uh, at the level of uh, intratelencephalic neurons and not at the level of random neurons in the population, okay? So consistent with the hypothesis, there is a contralateral population bias that uh, arises during the delay period in anticipation of the movement, but only, uh, as I mentioned, only late uh, during the uh, uh, delay period. So uh, what this suggests then is that they're widely distributed uh, motor plan across intracellencephalic neurons. Uh, and uh, a motor command really arises at the level of pyramidal tract neurons and then drives perhaps or biases directional licking by projecting into the uh, motor centers in the brainstem. There are other possibilities here because this motor cortical area is actually upstream of other motor cortical areas. And so to uh, show that this uh, population bias is actually causally related uh, to uh, upcoming uh, direction licking, uh, we did a photostimulation experiment where we now uh, use a specific driver line uh, to put chanodopsin into uh, pyramidal tract neurons and uh, excite uh, the pyramidal tract neurons during the delay period and look at subsequent movements. And what we find is that this is now at sub-threshold uh, stimulation, way below threshold for evoking uh, movements. And when we uh, photostimulate the pyramidal tract neurons during the delay period. Uh, during the response, hundreds of milliseconds later, we now 
cause a strong contralateral uh, bias. And uh, we've also combined uh, these photostimulation experiments with uh, recordings. And in fact, this photostimulation uh, can, can, can occur right during the sample period and causes a persistent change, a persistent uh, contra population bias uh, consistent with the uh, behavioral effects, OK? OK, so uh, what I've shown you then is that um, bidirectional manipulations uh, of this anterolateral motor cortex suggest that preparatory activity in these areas actually causally related to upcoming movements. And I think uh, that preparatory activity in these premotor areas, perhaps in other premotor areas, is then causally related to upcoming movements and, in fact, uh, constitutes a motor plan. And, uh, we uh, have evidence, and I think uh, uh, Mike Gork here, for example, uh, uh, working at MIT, has evidence that this is not uh, just selective for licking, but also other movements, okay? Um, now, uh, as I've shown you, neurons for multiple movement directions are intermingled, and the directional population activity, really, the motor command uh, manifests itself, itself really only at the output neurons, okay? So we think. Uh, this could be a, uh, perhaps a, a, a kind of a general conclusion that uh, motor planning related activities widely distributed in intratelencephalic neurons, perhaps involving multiple motor areas, perhaps even parietal uh, areas, and is then read out and converted into specific kind of actions by pyramidal tract neurons that uh, evoke uh, specific kinds of movements, okay? Why uh, do we have uh, the, why does the movement uh, command come on late during the delay period? This could be part uh, of the answer of why the animal does not uh, uh, respond until, uh, the, until uh, the go cue, because the movement potent activity in the uh, motor descending uh, neurons does not really arise until close to the movement command. Now, this is close to the movement command. These Time scales are still a couple of hundred milliseconds, which is long for motor control. Uh, and we think that the uh, go cue, in addition, okay, recruits a disinhibitory signal uh, through the basal ganglia to also uh, facilitate movements. And I think more broadly, many of us, many of those of us who are recording from uh, cortical circuits, cortical network, are. Uh, you know, stunned by the bewildering complexity of the responses of cortical neurons. And I think this analysis and, and others like it really highlight that uh, this complex dynamics really has to be interpreted uh, in the context of uh, structured, hierarchically organized circuits. And I think uh, this kind of analysis can at least explain some of that uh, great diversity and, and variance. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I think this is, uh, this is exactly right. We're actually working on that, yeah. So, uh, so you, you'd really like to, there you're kind of, you have dynamics and you'd like to see whether or not specific modes, right, in some sense map onto uh, projection classes. And, 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 and partially they do. I, we've done this kind of stuff uh, in these methods. We have on the order of a dozen uh, neurons recorded simultaneously. So, and, and, and this would be a whole other talk. For example, this population bias, right, uh, that, uh, that I've shown you at the level of PT neurons shows up as a mode in some sense, but there's actually still a, at the go queue dramatic change in the network. Uh, and, and during this change in the network that you, that you pick up at the level of population analysis, but the contra bias in the pyramidal tract neurons survives that, right? So many things going on, and we, we're very much interested in, in mapping 
uh, modes and sort of uh, dynamical systems analysis on those specific cell types. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, so so that I think I think because during a lot of the, uh, the because there, we think that the contralateral in in this simple task at least the contralateral population activity um, is causal related. Okay, is required uh, to drive the contralateral licking, and that comes up only relatively late during the delay period. So this is part of that explanation. But there must be. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Right. There must be other mechanisms. There are, there are probably multiple mechanisms that, that converge. And, and uh, uh, so, so this, as, as, as in the eye movement, some disinhibitory signals through the, through the substantial nigra reticulata in the rodents would be my uh, favorite guess right now. That's a good question. Yeah. There's no licking for the delay period, but I'm wondering if there's really no movement, whether if there is a two different movement motor sequences that could be engaged earlier. Um, using other parts of the body that could, could be, yeah, yeah. No, no, that, that could be, there could be some stereotypy. But of course, here we, we can manipulate cortical activity to change the behavior. So we know that the cortical activity is cause related to the, to the future movement, right? But for uh, the recordings, it's harder to, harder to say. The recordings, it's, you don't know if the recordings are premotor or motor from a different motor uh, action than, than a link. Yeah. We did not see an effect on, on, on licking. Yeah, if we, if we stimulated, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, so that's true, not during the, uh, during the preparatory activity, uh, but uh, the, that I didn't show you. Uh, uh, the experiment that I showed you was actually a mapping experiment during uh, anesthesia. And uh, we already knew from other experiments that this area has a relatively low threshold for evoking uh, licking. So this is a little confusing um, in the sense that uh, functionally, uh, this looks like a premotor cortex, but there is a strong uh, descending uh, motor uh, projection. But that's also true in premotor areas in primates, yeah. right? So that is often forgotten. So yeah. I'm trying to figure out the connection with the primate also. Uh, yeah. No, no, everyone sees, uh, so, so everyone sees more, pr uh, so the further premotor you go, the more preparatory activity you have, basically. And, um, and the, the kind of the quantitative comparison, if I ask the question, what fraction of my neurons have preparatory activity only, which fraction of preparatory and perimovement activity, which fraction of perimovement activity, it's about a third and third and third, which is premotor cortex-like in primate. Uh, in, in reaching task, if you, if you can uh, compare that. But there's a, there's a direct projection uh, through the pyramidal tract to the, to the brain stem, but of course from premotor cortex, you also have projections to the spinal cord and, and, and so on. Yeah. So the, the exact correspondence is really, uh, it's a matter of uh, a lot of, lot of work has to be done to really make sense of that, yeah. So.